All right. All right, good evening. Uh, welcome. Thank you for coming to tonight's event, part of the Marketing Roundtable event series. The event this evening is brought to you by Ann Arbor Spark. Uh, Ann Arbor Spark is a supporter of high-tech business and innovation in the Washtenaw County area. The event is being live streamed at annarborusa.org, thanks to Russell Video. If you're an online viewer, you can submit questions at any time. Um, for the live viewers, if you can write down your questions on the cards, and I uh, will come around and pick them up for the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. Um, also, just a reminder, if you could turn off your cell phones. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight's program, who is also the chair of the Knights of the Marketing Roundtable. And I will let him take it away, David Bloom. I did take conducting in college. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello, David. Thank you, Bill. Hello, both of you out there streaming us. This program is one of my favorites of the year. Now, I know I say that every month. But this is the one that I'm going to moderate. What makes me so, so happy to be up here today is this rock star panel that we've put together for the program Startup Marketing. I met each of them under very interesting circumstances. So I'm going to tell you those stories. I'm going to introduce the panel. And then they're the show. I'm going to go off and eat shrimp. So I want to begin with my, uh, my friend, my neighbor, my photographer, Michelle Massey Barnes, uh, who I met on Facebook. It's how people meet these days, yeah. Um, and Michelle has a most amazing entrepreneurial Jones that is the exact mirror of her artistic eye. And the two of them complement each other really, really well. So the stories that you're going to hear from Michelle are ground up stories. And I don't mean ground up like ground beef. I mean from the ground up because that's how she built her business. It started off as, uh, gee, I'm going to take pictures and now it's uh, multiplying revenues, it's hiring people, it's booking lots more of the kind of work that she loves to do. And that love is evident in what you're about to see. Now, I was trying to figure out where I exactly met Shannon Culver, and we figured it out. It was at IT Zone. Who remembers IT Zone? Yeah. So uh, Shannon, Shannon was, was uh, briefly associated with IT Zone, and, and I kind of coming and going at IT Zone through the years. And we uh, passed ways and, and kind of made note of each other. And then we s kept seeing each other through our different startup hats. And we have to keep saying, okay, now who are you working for now? Okay, who am I working for now? Because we're serial startup freaks. And that's how we know each other is, you know, hi, how you doing? Okay, who are you working for now? Um, so Shannon has done the Michelle thing. She's done it several times. She's done it in a B2B context instead of a B2C context. And our theme today actually came from Shannon. All of our panelists today are here to tell stories because marketing is storytelling. And what we're going to do is tell some marketing stories. So it's a kind of a self-referential uh, topic. Catherine and I met in 1997. Some of you were even alive then. And we, we, we have been around the block, um, but honestly, uh, the latest transition that Catherine made was particularly uh, uh, meaningful because she took a, a step in the direction of building more great startups into second stage uh, companies, emerging companies that had uh, different perhaps operating parameters and, and different uh, value propositions than the startups that, that uh, they grew out of. But honestly, she has grown several marketing businesses. So the stories that she's going to tell are going to be all your pro tips that you're going to be taking fierce notes and going back to the video later to say, OK, what did she say? So that's my intro to this, to this panel. And if I can find the clicker, I'm going to let Michelle lead it off. And what I want is every time I click, for you to make the noise of the slide that you're looking at. This will become obvious to you in just a moment. I'm going to turn this over to, can turn your mic on, please, 
Michelle Massey Barnes. Ready? Oh, that was the introduction slide. <laughs> yeah, were we saying hello, David again? No, Bill, you cannot. Uh, no, no, no. Okay, make the noise, not a laugh. Thank you for coming this evening. I wanted to start with this slide because it has a lot of personal significance for me and really tells my story of relationship marketing. This is my son, Porter. He is our third, and he was born last December. And I took this photograph of him when he was three days old. I really love the photograph, and I had it printed as a gallery-wrapped canvas, which I brought so you could see I'm full of visual aids tonight. and it's upside down. So there it is. I wanted to bring this in because it's when this canvas came in the mail that I really started to understand what I was doing for my clients. Even now, I look at this and I can remember what he was like when he was so brand new. And otherwise, the sleep deprivation has erased all memories. <laughs> But it really has captured my relationship to my son. And that's when I realized that what I was doing was so much more than taking photographs, that I really was capturing relationships. Sometimes it's the relationships of the subjects in the photograph, but most of the time it's actually the relationship that the viewer has to the final product, like me and my story of Porter. So in part because the work that I'm doing is so relationship-based, and in part because I come to this work as a very relationship-oriented person, I decided to start marketing my business in a very relationship-based way. This past winter, I decided that I wanted to increase the number of high school seniors that I photographed. I love photographing high school seniors. It's one of my favorite things to photograph because they're so full of personality. But the previous year, I'd only photographed two high school seniors, so I knew that I had a lot of work to do if I was going to increase that number. So, with the help of some good friends, I was able to put together a senior modeling campaign. And basically, what we did was we gathered together and um, found these people through contacts, some of them directly through Facebook. I sent friend, requ friend requests to friends of friends that were high school girls or their parents, in this particular case it was girls, and asked them if they wanted to take part in a senior modeling session. The sessions were complimentary. We did three sessions that each had three girls. And my goal was to photograph really fun images that told the story of who they were and put my work out and gave me an image-based portfolio to start showing my work to their friends and their families. In the beginning, my goal was really to get the models excited and to get their parents excited and to hope and help them start telling other people about the work that I was doing. In terms of the overall success of the campaign, it has been really successful. I've already photographed, I have 10 senior sessions booked this year. There's three more in the sales pipeline and the yearbook photos aren't due until the end of October. So it's likely that there could be even more than that. So in terms of the overall growth, I think that that's great growth. But the real success of the campaign, I've realized, doesn't actually have to do with just the number of sessions that we booked. It has to do with the relationships that I was able to build and establish with the people that I photographed and the families that I was working with. Click. So this is Michaela. And ooh. She was the first high school senior that we photographed this season, and she really loved her images, which makes me feel really good as a photographer when a high school girl can look at photographs of herself and feel good, and she did. And what I want to tell you is that the reason that she loved her images so much, it wasn't because I went on location and happened to just get lucky and take good photographs. It was because I had already sat down with her and with her mom before the session. I got to know Michaela. I got to know what she liked. I got to know what she liked about herself. I also was able to find out what are the types of things that make her feel beautiful. So when I showed up at her session, I already knew those things because I had already started 
and establish this relationship with her. So then it was just the fun part. Then I got to do the photographic work, and we had a great time. So she did love her images. She has been telling her friends about the work that we're doing, and she has been posting things to my Facebook page, thanking me for a great session and for the images that we were able to capture. Her mom also loved the images, which is fantastic. I knew what her mom wanted. I was able to talk to them about what to wear and make sure that one of the outfit choices Michaela was going to pick was something that was going to please the parents, which is really important when you're working with essentially two clients. So for the mom, the images like these, they capture the same story that the canvas of Porter captures for me. They capture the mother's relationship to her daughter and how her daughter is starting to go off into the world to start to do her own thing, a very exciting time. But more importantly than just establishing this client, this one-time client, what the company has really gained is a fabulous client that we have a great relationship with. She's someone that we can ask for a testimonial after this particular session is complete. She hasn't received her images yet. She'll have them by the end of the week, which is exciting. I love delivering the final product. But she's also someone, both Michaela and her mother, that this spring I'll feel very comfortable calling and saying, you know, we have our new senior marketing promotional pieces in, and I'm just wondering if you know any upcoming seniors that might be interested in a session like the kind of session that you had, could you tell them about us? I'm sure that she'll say yes, because I already have that kind of a relationship with her. I already know that she's enjoyed the kind of work that we're doing, and that she's already told me that she wants to be part of telling other people about the work that we're doing. It's not just this particular client that I have that goal with. My goal is to have that kind of experience and that kind of relationship with every client that I photograph. So the next one is <laughs> Very nice. Her name is Abby, and she is another high school senior that I photographed. And Abby happened to be the grand champion winner at the fair for a photograph that she had submitted. Completely ironically, I was asked to be the judge. I had no idea that it was Abby's image that I was judging, but I gave her the blue ribbon. So I knew that she got this blue ribbon, and when I found out that it was actually Abby's image that had been submitted, I knew I had a portrait session with her the following week. I got in touch with someone who runs a local website that tells about and features different local news events. So I got in touch with my press contact, told her about the photograph that Abby had submitted, how it won the Grand Champion Ribbon, and asked her, would you feature Abby? And she was thrilled because I helped her with her work. I gave her a great story that will generate leads and traffic to her website. And I also said, I'm photographing her next week. I'll photograph her with her ribbons. So I was able to really build and strengthen that press relationship that I have. At the same time, I was able to make Abby feels so good because she was being recognized for the hard work that she was doing and I took the time to let her know that I was recognizing her. So it turns out when I was photographing her session, I mentioned to her, oh yeah, I really want to start doing these workshops, like these creative workshops for high school seniors, or not for high school seniors, for high school kids. And I was going to have them, you know, like telling her a little bit about them. And she's really excited about these. And she says, I love this idea and I want to come. And I was like, oh, you do? Great. And she's like, and I'll tell my friends. So all of a sudden, this relationship that I've started establishing starts to begin to develop. And now I have someone willing to go and tell her friends about the workshops that I want to run. And of course, the biggest reason that I want to run these workshops is a marketing reason because I'm developing relationships with my potential senior clients. And it's not just that they're high school kids that I'm building relationships with. I know that there are students that are interested in artwork, they're interested in photography, and they're probably going to be looking for something that is more personality-based and a little bit different, which really helps position me as a great photographer for them. So. than me taking notes. Uh, we're going to hold questions to the end. Those cards that are on chairs in front of you are your question cards, and I'm going to be collecting those um, when, when we've had three panel talks. And uh, then we begin the fun part, which is where you get to do the talking and we get to answer the questions. Um, now I want to 
uh, turn it over to Shannon. Okay. I'm going to be clicking your slides when you tell me to. Boom. I did not bring my own notes, so I've got to turn to actually see what I'm supposed to be talking about. And I did not bring my own glasses, and <laughs> I can't see that. <laughs> so David and I met for lunch, and uh, you know, trying to wrap up what you, your whole career or what you believe about marketing in in one you know succinct sentence is is a tough assignment. And I said, you know. Uh, marketing is just storytelling, and that's basically what it is. And I think if you can, uh, the many aspects of it, bring it around to what do people want. They want to hear a story, and they want to hear a good story, and that's really our job as um, marketers. So marketers are good storytellers. Uh, Seth Godin wrote a book called uh, All Marketers Are Liars, and I, you know, I took exception to that because they, there may be some truth bending in there or some braggadociousness, but uh, it has to be truth and it has to be a good story. So uh, marketers are good storytellers. And why? Uh, in the whole realm of things, I know some of the businesses that I've been involved in have been very technical. And technical information is super interesting to other people that are technical, but if you start going technical on me, I'm like, whoa, zoning out. But if you can wrap a story around it about why is that interesting, why do those numbers make any difference at all, you can get kindergartners to pay attention to you because it becomes a story, and anyone will sit still for a story. So the other good thing about storytelling is one is the emotional connection that you can make with your audience, and second, a story can be repeated. So you may meet somebody that's not a target, but if they know your story and they know someone that is in, in your target, they can repeat your story and it's just as good as you saying it. So a story needs to be something memorable and repeatable that makes a connection with an audience. Um, so the other things I said on there is find the people that can care and then consistently tell that story and I'll tell you why as we click through. So. My background, just so I, you know who you're listening to here, is all small business. From the time that I got out of high school, I have never worked in a big company. Um, I'm not built that way, and I, I knew it. <laughs> From the time, I didn't do well even in a classroom situation. I need to be someplace where I can uh, break the rules. So some of my experiences, uh, B2C, it's mostly B2B, um, and I'll run through some of these uh, companies where I've been involved and tell you uh, what's happened with those. So if you'll just click, we'll get to the first one. Very soon out of college, in fact, when I was still in high school, I met Dale Fisher, and people that have been around Ann Arbor for a long time probably are familiar with him. He's a photographer. His platform is a helicopter. So right there, that's a great story. There's a lot of people that take pictures, and, but very few take them from a helicopter. Um, but back then, you have to go way back, this is 1983, so there was no internet, there was no texting, there were no smartphone phones, there was, you know, phone books and you calling up people. So in that particular situation, when you're trying to find a broader audience for a, a photography market, what we were looking for is, well, who cares? You know, what, who wants to make a difference or who really cares about a, a photograph? You, as we just heard, there are strong emotional connections with pictures, but from a photograph with a helicopter of a building or a site, it is not the same thing as your beautiful baby boy. <laughs> it's a whole different uh, thing. So um, Dale Fisher is still working today and still making fantastic images and uh, does, a, does a great job. You can still run into him. Uh, but back at this time, it was uh, about to be General Motors' 75th anniversary something that's commonly known. They are located in Detroit, also commonly known. They really cared, and they had a big network of people that also cared about Detroit and, De and uh, um, General Motors' image. So we were able to get to them through, um, back at that time, it was pretty much call everybody you knew, and um, the press departments, and we finally were able to get into there, actually through a person that had written an article on General Motors that introduced us up the chain. Um, we ended up doing General Motors' uh, book on Detroit, which made Detroit look absolutely beautiful. 
I call this nostalgia storytelling because people, you want your city to look beautiful. There's people that love Detroit. There's people that love Ann Arbor, and you want it to look good. People have nostalgic feelings about their surroundings, and we were really able to tap into that for General Motors. And in turn, they were excited to tell that story with this book. Similar thing happened, and Dale was able to do Michigan's uh, official sesquicentennial book in 1987. Sesquicentennial was when Michigan turned 150. So it was the official book for the state, um, made Michigan look absolutely gorgeous. That book was used extensively outside the state for tourism campaigns. Why? Because it, it was gorgeous. It made people love Michigan, have strong feelings about Michigan, and we were able to get to the right people that cared about Michigan to be able to sell those two things. Now Dale's still working, you know, he finds a lot of different audiences and a lot of uh, uh, different things. I don't help him anymore, but his uh, photos are still uh, highly relevant. Go ahead. I also worked for Joe Curtin and Greg Alf, and they've been around Ann Arbor for a long time as well. They're violin makers, which is similar to photography in that it's an art. Oh, as we go through this, I have been very fortunate in my whole career to attach myself to people that had great stories all by themselves. Violin making is super interesting, and it's not hard to market. But at this particular time, and I worked for Greg and Joe for uh, 10 years, um, again, no internet, there you know, was phone, telephones, there were... Um, uh, you know, press and things like that, but it was tough to get to who cares. And what we did, there was a couple of really interesting things. We did a partnership with uh, UMS here, Ken Fisher. At the time, Greg and Joe had a studio over in Prospect Street, and when UMS sponsored a concert, we would invite the entire orchestra over for dinner. <laughs> that was a lot of cooking, but it was a lot of fun. We just had a great time. So we were getting to the people that cared but a strange thing about um, sound and music is that it's super subjective. And like many young artists, musicians um, will invest, invest millions of dollars in an instrument because of what the label is, not because of what it sounded like. That was a big problem for new instrument makers. So we had to figure out how to make people care that they could own a Curtin and Alf instrument worth $15,000 instead of a Strad worth, you know, two million. So what we did was uh, we partnered with scientists to do a double-blind uh, sound test. And uh, the newer instruments, we had more instruments than just ours, and we also had Strads and Guarneris and some great old instruments alternated. And the newer instruments, actually, without the fix in, I know we took a ris risk on this one, they won. So with that, we were able to tell that story, that there's no reason to forego owning a house or be in debt forever to own a new instrument or to own a, an old master. You can own a new instrument and sound great, and here's the proof of it. So um, just interestingly, after that, we were able to sell an instrument to uh, Ol Elmar Oliveira, well-known uh, violinist, who played that instrument for a while and then sold it at auction at Sotheby's for the record price for a new uh, violin ever sold. So that was kind of kudos. So go ahead. After th uh, these slides are out of order, skip one. <coughs> yeah, sorry. Go. Bluegill Technologies was my next gig. And Bluegill was, um, until very recently, had the biggest exit for technology um, in Ann Arbor. So we were sold in uh, 2000 for $250 million, which made people in Ann Arbor very wealthy, as well as our development team was all in Canada. Um, Bluegill Technologies was an interesting thing. It was the boom of the internet. People that have done startups before, it was just a fast and furious rocket ship ride. It was great fun. Um, and the storytelling there, I was actually the first employee here in the United States of uh, Bluegill Technologies. And what we did there was, um, it was very disruptive. And what we did was name a shared enemy of the post office, <laughs> which sounds ridiculous, but who we were dealing with was big print houses, uh, people that, that mailed a lot, 
and they don't like the post office. They just don't. And people that were receiving bills on the other side, we had pictures of mailboxes out in the snow with the mail kind of strewn around, and everyone could identify with it. So what Bluegill was doing, sorry, I should have uh, thrown that in there, was they developed technology to, so you could receive your bill direct from your uh, DTE or AT&T or whatever, directly through email. Now you say, duh, but back in 1996, that was a very new idea. So, um, so naming the post office made an interesting story. You know, death to the post office, and people go, what? <laughs> you know, what are you talking about? The other thing that we really developed as a story is we're going to change the world. And that story we told outside of our company, but m even probably more importantly than we told it inside the company. And startups at that time, you really sold your life to that startup. In fact, I, I say at that time, still do. You know, you know it's your baby. It's going to take over 24-7. So you better have a good story to tell people that you want to come work for you. You better have a good story for investors. You better have a good story for press and analysts and all those people that you need to build a community to make that a success. And for Bluegill, um, it was those two things, death of the post office and we're out to change the world. We're out to change the way business is done. We were successful at both. Um, the, the post office is not dead, but we sure did put a dent in their business. I don't actually hate them. It just made a good story. So. Um, yeah, go back. Uh, after Bluegill exited, I went to work for Ardesta, which um, at that time, that's Rick Snyder's uh, um, incubator. I know, believe it or not. And um, we had, uh, I had charge of marketing responsibilities for three companies there. Um, Ardesta was designed as an incubation firm for MEMS and uh, nano-based technology, which at that time was also super, super revolutionary, really interesting stuff. The place was crawling with scientists and it was tough to do marketing there, um, partly because things were so new and so, so different. Um, I'll just run through these quickly. Sensicore was uh, MEMS-based water sensing, typically. And who cares about that? Well, it turned out that people in uh, wastewater treatment plants cared a whole lot. Believe it or not, in the city of Detroit, in their wastewater treatment plant, they have more than 150 inspection points that they send a human to every single hour and come back with reports. They do the lab work and, you know, figure out water quality. And Sensacore was able to put sensors there to uh, send alarms. They could send it all back through telemetry. So it was people savings, but the, the real message of the story was, are you safe? Is your water safe? So wastewater treatment plants cared. Also, people traveling, they, they developed just a little handheld sensor. If you're out and about, everyone knows, you know, you don't drink the water in Mexico and places like that. You could drop this little sensor in there to know, is the water drinkable, yes or no? Is it going to make you sick? So that, the whole message there was, are you safe? And that was, um, they were able to leap into uh, business and consumer marketing with that particular tool. Since, of course, it's since been sold. Desera is a, uh, still an ongoing concern. They um, were developing cell phone components, and the, still are. They're very successful. We're, we're also sold. They're out in uh, California now because their main investor was there. That was kind of cool because everyone knows, like, the Dick Tracy watch, you know, and how cool it is when things get smaller and smaller. They were making things smaller and smaller. So the cool factor there was very, very high, and um, that was you know, the whole smartphone and, ev you know, it was just coming out then. They've also been very successful in that market. And as we know, things are just com continue to miniaturize in that, in uh, cell phones. Last was a uh, Transloom. There's femtosecond laser technology, which is really cool, but hard to explain. What they were doing at the time was uh, um, building switches in blocks of glass. Now, who cares about that? Well, all the telecommunication companies and cable companies and the internet fiber optic cable, they care a lot because this is not a mechanical switch. This is a, actually a block of glass impervious, impervious to uh, temperature change or weather or anything like that. It, it's fine. At the time Transloom, that I was at Transloom, 
the bottom completely fell out of the telecommunications market. That was kind of the, the edge of the uh, internet bust. And um, I was with our Desta not long enough for Translum to turn around, although they have, they're doing fine now. They found some uh, uh, army contract and some other things. They're uh, doing just great, but they're still around. We click next. I'll oh, click next again. How's that? So in all of that, I think the, the main message is build your story, refine your story so it's interesting. Try it out on different people. Try it to people that are not in your industry. Make sure that you can tell a story that's quickly understood. And uh, second, find the people that care and tell those story too. And that can be a tough assignment to figure out who cares about this, but those are the people that you need to reach out and tell that story to. So that's that. Thank you, Shannon. All right, so I've, I've been uh, told I have to do all the clicking now for, for Catherine as well. And, and Catherine's title, I'm, I'm gonna do a reveal here, is Catherine's Online Marketing Tips. David's having fun with the reveals. I tried to make this simple with one slide, but now we've got 10 or something like that. So that's why, <laughs> that's why he's doing the reveal. Uh, I'll be all right, I got the screen right behind me, thank you. All right, so this is great that we've had so much about storytelling from Michelle and Shannon, thank you. Um, basically what I'm gonna do is give you the platform for that story. So my passion is internet marketing. Um, my love for the internet started back in the early 90s, and yes, there was an internet back in the early 90s. Uh, as an early adopter, my job has essentially been one of an evangelist and teacher um, over the last several years, and I think you'll agree that um, over the last 20 years or so, we've all gotten a lot more familiar with things like Google, YouTube, fancy new things like Facebook. Uh, so the need for evangelism um, isn't quite there anymore. Um, so I've changed my focus. Um, my new passion is helping people put together all of the pieces. So what you see a lot of right now in uh, internet marketing is how to do Facebook, how to do AdWords, how to do whatever the newest thing out there is. Um, there's not a lot about how do you put the pieces together to grow your business. That's really my passion. That's really what I've been doing over the last 15 years is helping companies figure out how to master the internet and the wonderful thing is, in the last few years, there's so many free tools to do it that it's much more accessible to startups. So it's fun to be able to do this speech today versus 10 years ago, because today there's free tools to do everything you need to do to get started. So without further ado, we'll get through the top 10. In a true David Letterman style, we'll start with number 10. Uh, stake your claim. So this one um, may sound simple, but it's important. Even if you don't think you're gonna use Facebook, even if you think you don't, you're not gonna use Twitter, please go out and reserve your domain name. <laughs> please go out and reserve your name and all of the popular services. Um, it's very hard to get later and it can be very expensive if you don't get it when you're starting out. Trust me, I know. <laughs> uh, build your site with a blog platform. So I'm a strong advocate of building websites with a blog platform. Uh, I don't care whether you use Blogger, whether you use, um, why am I drawing a blank? No, thank you, WordPress. It's good to have all these experts here with me. Um, I'm using Tumblr for mine. Uh, they're all free, um, so any one of them is gonna help you. They're gonna help you in a couple of ways. One, they're gonna get you up and running very quickly. Two, they're gonna make it very easy for you to share your stories. Uh, and. Um, one of the things that I've seen happen a lot with startups is um, sort of falling into the rabbit hole of custom website design. And sometimes it takes a year, sometimes it takes two years to crawl back out of that rabbit hole. So my first recommendation would be to start with a blog platform and once you've got things established, once you know where you're going, then you can work with one of the wonderful designers in town like Angela Piero over here to get your uh, website designed at that point. Strongly consider using a template. So there are lots of templates available in WordPress and all of these other blogging platforms, uh, free ones. Um, the one I'm using, I think, costs 79 bucks. Um, you can basically get between, for 
$29 to $150, you can find templates that are highly customizable to give your site a look and feel that's going to match the branding that you're going for. Um, again, just a quick startup tip that's going to help you get going faster. Start collecting data now. So this may not sound important at the beginning. Why do I need to collect data? Uh, but eventually, you're going to have a question for a marketer or somebody, and you're going to want to know what's working on your website. And the only way to know is if you've already collected the data. So when you get that website set up, ask somebody to hook up Google Analytics for you. It's also free. Uh, and it's going to take you know, an hour-ish to do, give or take. So it's not something that it's a big investment of time or money, and it's one you'll be very grateful when you start to have questions about what's working well and what's not. Really consider your keywords. So I, coming from the search engine marketing world, um, this is a story I've seen over and over again. I'll give you just one example, but I have many. Um, you're probably all familiar with the company Decon and the work that they do. We can all get their little traps for getting rid of mice. Uh, and I talked with the ad agency that did the search engine marketing for their company. And uh, I wonder if anybody here might guess what the keyword was that they were optimizing for. Yeah, that, that'd be a good one. Yeah, that, hmm? Another good one, yeah. It was a technical industry term that they chose. <laughs> Rodenticide. That was the word that they were optimizing for. <laughs> and they owned it. <laughs> they did, yes. And this is the trap of search engine marketing. <laughs> okay, you can own just about anything. <laughs> Whether it's worth owning is another question. <laughs> so I'm personally not going to go look for rodenticide when I need to kill a rat. I'm probably going to look for rat poison. Um, and that might be the thing you want to optimize for. And that's kind of a funny example because it's fairly obvious. Um, but we see a version of that in almost every single client we ever worked with at Pure Visibility. Um, I guess I will give you a second example. Another one was a bulletproof glass company. Uh, and bulletproof glass, technically, it's not bulletproof. It's bullet resistant. And so to be technically correct, the term that he was optimizing for was bullet resistant. Uh, but there's this handy little tool that Google, call, uh, d Google has. It's called Insights for Search. And Insights for Search will let you compare terms and see the relative popularity. And if you compare, uh, not surprisingly, bulletproof glass and bullet-resistant glass, you'll get two very different results. So our counsel is always go for the word where you're going to be able to attract more people, because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get more customers and sell more stuff. Uh, and then you can educate your customer with the stories about, you know, what the difference is between bulletproof and bullet resistant or whatever the particular case that you have is. So considering your keywords is really fundamental to make sure you get to the right people. Um, I'm not going to have to talk about five very much because our presenters earlier did this a lot. It's thinking about who your audience is and how you're going to reach them. A lot of websites get put up that are, these are all the different departments that we have, or you know, functionally talking about the business. Ideally, you're going to structure your website so it's not about you functionally, but it's about the customer and how they want to interact with you. And thinking about the kinds of things that we've heard about earlier today are the perfect way to think about how to structure your website for your audience. So you can get Google's opinion on your site. They've got another great free tool called Webmaster Tools, another thing that I highly recommend for everybody that's got a website. Basically, they're going to give your website a once-over, and they're going to tell you, you know, hey, you've reused this title tag on every single page. You ought to think about changing that. Uh, they'll tell you, hey, upload a sitemap, because that's going to help us find all the pages on your site. Um, so they're basically going to give you the closest thing to a how-to that Google's ever going to give you. Uh, strong, thoughtful calls to action. So I've used both phrases there, strong and thoughtful, for a reason. Uh, strong is the idea, you've watched late night TV in the hall, you know, buy one now, get the second one free, um, because that stuff works. <laughs> And if you're running Google AdWords, like Bud Gibson does here, you learn pretty quickly 
uh, that certain words really attract different people. And being specific is one of the major tricks in marketing. So if you want people to call you, you just need to say, call me in one of those giant buttons on your website. If you want them to email you, you need to ask them to email you. And I say do this thoughtfully because I can't tell you the number of people that I've sat down with and I've asked, so what works better when somebody contacts you? Does somebody convert better if they send you an email or if they call you and you get a chance to talk to them? And you know they'll say, oh, well, definitely. When we get a chance to talk to people, we can explain how unique our product is, et cetera, et cetera. That's the way that everybody converts. And then we go look at their website. And everywhere on their website, it says, contact us here. And it's a form. So it's one of those stop and think about what it is that works for your business. And then make sure that's reflected on your website. OK, blog. This is the equivalent of eating your vegetables. Um, Nobody wants to blog, or very few people want to blog. But these beautiful stories that we've talked about, getting those stories out there in a blog is one of the best ways to get the word out. Um, blogging makes a huge difference. Some of the things that matter most to Google is content. You're going to have more keyword diversity if you're writing more copy. Um, there are all sorts of wonderful reasons that blogging is a really good thing for your business. If you don't like writing, that doesn't mean you can't blog. There are plenty of newspaper writers out there who would love some extra work. Um, hire one. Uh, there are plenty of copywriters. We're here with the University of Michigan. There's plenty of English students. It's not hard to find people that will love to write for your site. Um, and in fact, that bulletproof glass example that I mentioned earlier, um, he's got a ghostwriter that works with him, interviews him once a month, puts together stories, um, and then those stories get optimized and added to the blog. It's made a huge difference in the traffic to the website. Um, it's really not a big secret, but it's something that a lot of people don't take the time to do. So if you eat your veggies and you figure out how to get that copy written and you do the blogging, you just about guarantee it's going to make a difference in how many people are coming to your site. And of course, eventually, how many people are buying. And when you're blogging, the best thing to do from there is share. Now, whether you love Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff or not, um, one of the things to consider is that Google looks at the wisdom of crowds to decide who they're going to put at the top of the search engines. And we see this more and more with Google Plus and other kinds of social search. So basically, it's the direction that the world is moving. And making sure that your content is an active part of that universe is another key to staying relevant and getting more hits through Google. So that's basically, you know, my whole background is making sure how can we get more people to your website so that you can then get more of those people to convert. And all of this up here is that first step, that foundation for building something that's going to help attract people more to your site. Um, I could talk all day long about how you convert them once they get there and all that good stuff. So instead of um, going on for hours, I wrote a book. Uh, it's called Internet Marketing Start to Finish. And what it does is brings together all of those pieces. So I talked about how what you see today is a lot of how to do LinkedIn, Facebook, those specific things. Um, there's a real hole in the market in terms of helping people understand really how do these pieces fit together to drive um, business to my company. And that's what that book is designed to do, to help put all the pieces together from Salesforce to the AdWords that you use to drive people there. All right, this is the fun part. Now we know who to ask what questions to. So this is the time when you reach under your butt and get out those question cards, and then you ask Mary Cat for a pen because you forgot one. And I ask a couple softball questions to start things off with, but I know you're going to hit me with the torrent right after that. Uh, and I want to ask a question about virality, which is something that all three of you have touched on. And I'm going to break my own rule, and I'm going to ask you all three this question. Uh, I heard a wonderful comment first from Michelle about how she used press, generated press on one of her clients and what was the reciprocal effect on that? And, and the example that you gave of teenagers Facebooking to each other and doing basically all of the marketing heavy lifting for you. 
um, I guess the technical marketroid term would be incented viral marketing. You're, you're creating story and packaging it for somebody else to go and deliver. Can you tell me about how you built that package, that story that is not really the thing that you're talking about with your picture with Porter, but rather the thing that uh, Abby tells her friend or Michaela tells her friend? Well, one of the ways that I'm able to do that through Facebook is by after the clients come in and they place their order, then I ask them if I can post a few of their favorite images to Facebook, and sometimes I post some behind the scenes of their session to Facebook as well. And those behind the scenes shots have also been very helpful in encouraging the viral behavior because they're not, when, when they're talking to their friends, they're not saying, look at my beautiful portrait of myself. Very few high schoolers actually say that to each other. Many mothers say that about their babies. But when you're marketing to high schoolers, I needed a different way to get them talking. And it was about the experience that they had. So when I post a few previews from their session, they're then given the visual content that they need to go on and talk about the experience that they had with Michelle Massey Barnes photography. And that is what starts spreading um, face to face and also through some of the social applications like Facebook. Awesome. Uh, similar question f uh, for you, Shannon, in, in talking a little bit about the small non-high school but nevertheless insular communities that Curtin and Alf sell to or that the MEMS companies sell to, you also have the same challenge in getting this story to a very self-selected audience, an audience that may or may not want to go viral for you. They may actually want to keep you a secret. How do you break through some of this and get the leverage that, that we heard um, creates the market uh, 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 momentum for your VC? And, and your VC in this case was Rick Snyder. Oh, are you ta talking about MEM stuff or back to violin stuff? Well, it could be either, yeah. <laughs> violin stuff, I can tell you, we used an expert. Elmar Oliveira was a huge, huge supporter to us. And if you can uh, find that one person or Sometimes you have many to select from in the case of uh, performance violinists. There's a lot of them, but one that people trust that says, I did this and you should too, then that was worth um, a lot, a lot of money and a lot of sales for us. Thank you, Shannon. Um, and I'm, I'm going to hopefully not eat into your book sales at all, Catherine, but there's stories in that book that you teased us with that you said the converting actually happens in the book. And I wonder if you could pick one or, one or two stories that take us from 10 to 1 and then more. Uh, sh show us what happened next so that there can be like a payoff to these marketing stories. Sure. Um, one of the simple things that we've seen help conversions on a lot of websites, I imagine Bud has seen this too, is as soon as you reduce the amount of um, questions that you're asking somebody on a contact form, uh, your conversions tend to increase dramatically. Um, this is true for just about anything. So we've worked with very, very high-end ho hotels who insisted when a bride was going to get something done at their high-end hotel um, that they could ask every question under the sun, and that wasn't going to deter anybody because they were going to have their wedding there no matter what. Well, <laughs> um, when we reduced it to just a few questions, um, they saw a tremendous impact. And this, this took many, many months of negotiations to try this little experiment, um, which, truth be told, actually accidentally went live. <laughs> um, but the client was very, very happy with it. <laughs> and we wound up getting to keep it live um, because it worked even better, honestly, than, yes. than we expected, which is, yeah, always fun when things go go better than you thought they would. Uh, but the analogy that we use with contact forms is just think of it as a first date. Um, you're not going to ask somebody their social security number when you sit down the first time for coffee. Um, you're going to want to think about a contact form in sort of, sort of the same way. What's the bare minimum you need to get back in touch again um, and build the relationship from there? Very cool. Thank you. OK, for Shannon, please tell us about that relationship survey tool. That sounded very interesting relationship survey tool. It was part of your spiel. It was about Geneva? No? 
didn't talk about yeah i love to name all right i just read the cards all right right. (laughs) uh uh, apologies i don't want to ask any stumpers uh back to you catherine um can you tell us um the best value role for twitter especially in b2b and this is this is a crack the code question because a lot of us in the b2b world are going okay now what do we do next Let's see. So B2B um, is basically pure visibility specialty. So that's a lot of what we did there was B2B, especially with um, large enterprises. And Twitter was not one of the first places that we're typically recommending for a B2B company. Um, But one of the things that Twitter does really, really well is if you've got press or good news and you want to share those sorts of things, Um, they get shared very well through Twitter. It's all a matter of of figuring out the packaging and making it so that it's a story that's meaningful um, that that is going to want to be shared. Do you measure retweetability and try to write for for tweetability? I mean, sure. You're always going to want to think about um, how to make it something that's going to be as viral as possible. Yeah. All right. Next question. Thank you. Next question is for bifocals. Michelle, you said you had three more clients in a sales pipeline. You built a sales pipeline. Tell us about the sales pipeline. So I did build a sales pipeline. What's that? Well, a sales pipeline is all of my prospective clients that in one way or another have indicated at least potential interest in booking a session with me. Sometimes they are people that I don't know personally yet. Um, Sometimes it is someone can enter my sales pipeline by me sitting down with a family and them saying to me, and our friend so-and-so really loved what you did too, and they're interested in a session. And so then I know to follow up with that particular family to talk more about the next session. But one of the other ways from this relationship-based marketing that I really continue to build a sales pipeline is when I deliver the final product and follow up with them, so many times clients will say to me, that was so much fun. We really want to do another session with you next year. Well, that's another session for me that could pretty much be booked right now. And so I'll say to them, great, is it okay with you if I call you about six weeks out from the time that we want to do that session? That will give us enough time to get our appointments together and I'll be able to get you a time that is most convenient for your family. And of course they say yes, especially the parents of young children because they'll forget. So that is how I have developed and started filling my sales pipeline. Now you have a reminder tool that you use, or you are your own reminder tool? I just put it in my Google Calendar at mm-hmm. this point, and it pops up a little reminder and says, you know, call Robin, and I have a note about what I'm going to call her about, and it has her phone number and her email address. Okay, this belongs on Catherine's list. <laughs> That's a great way to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, Shannon, next question is, is about your work with getting two key accounts, the GM account and the Michigan, before it was pure, account. And you knew what you were selling, and you knew who your client was, but they didn't know they were going to buy from you yet. Tell the story of how you got them to see it your way. That goes back to a picture is worth a thousand words. So in, I think in any photography, if you can get in front of the right people, the same as with art and a lot violins to get in front of the right people uh, with your product it can really tell its own story and do its own selling with that general motors is a huge uh behemoth you know and they've got a lot of agencies it was tough to find the people that cared there and we really got kind of lucky that way because that there was no um uh you know internet to someone in charge of aerial photography for gm would be perfect yeah i will tell you in other companies that i've worked with when people put press out, there's almost always a marketing contact on that on a press release. I, when I'm looking for a lead in a company or who who cares in that company, I always call the marketing people because they love to talk. They want to tell the story. So and they're they are not uh, bound by the the people at the switchboard. They're trained, you know, to to just take your phone number and send your message to whoever wants it. But the marketing people are not. They will tell you anything you want to know. So those are, those are great um, people to, to get to know and, and develop. Is that tr- 
Was that true at the state of Michigan as well as at GM? Or was there a different? Very true, very true in both places. Awesome, thank you. All right, next question for Catherine. Um, give me your single best tip for setting people, getting people to convert. So this is, this is uh, drilling down on that whole call to action. You know, of the different calls to action, what's working? Keep it simple. Um, there, there are so many steps in the conversion process that that one's uh, hard to answer blind, but it's all of those things that we talked about from creating a button that's going to catch somebody's attention, um, making sure the button is visible on the page. Um, we've worked with Fortune 500 companies who um, were amazed at the idea that they ought to move the buy now button from below the fold using old newspaper terms to where people could see it when they first opened the page. Not surprisingly, this improved conversion rates. Um, you know, so it's, a, it's honestly a lot of really simple things like that and taking a really critical eye at what are all the steps that your customer has to go through and figuring out if you really need all those steps and how you can make those steps simpler and using tools like Google Analytics to test um, the results of what you're doing. That's what's so wonderful about doing this today is there are so many tools to test how you're doing, um, many A-B testing tools, all sorts of things that didn't used to be accessible to startups. So it's a really exciting world out there now. Cool, thank you. All right, next question, Michelle again. You talk a lot about relationships. How do you value a relationship? How do you know when a relationship is worthwhile or not worthwhile? It's a really good question because the amount of time that I'm spending with each client, it's a lot. So if I was spending it with clients that were not really very interested in the work that I was doing or only wanted one 8x10 photograph, I wouldn't have a very large profit margin. But I have found that clients that really just want a very simple portrait taken or aren't interested in developing a portfolio, they don't want to sit down with me and talk about their session. So that's one of the screening... They don't want a relationship. Yeah, they don't want a relationship, which is one of the screening tools that I have is on the first call that I have with people, I say I do things a little bit differently than you might be used to. I like to have everyone in for a consultation. We'll talk about your session. We'll go over what to wear. We'll talk about what you want to do with your images once, once we create them. The people that are into this are so happy because they know they're going to get custom help. The people that this is way too big of a project for because really all they wanted was that one print for their refrigerator, they say, no, thank you, and I've essentially screened them out. <laughs> wow. Keeps your cost of sales down. It does, but... All right, Shannon, you're up. Can you talk more about developing your story? And how do you know when your story is the right story? That's a good question. <laughs> so the stories need to be refined and they need to be tweaked for a correct audience. Um, and you probably can uh, talk on this more, but um, people react differently to your wording, the, the order that you put things in, uh, how, you how you're developing or how you're delivering that message. Sometimes things that you might say out loud, you won't put on your website. You know, you just don't. And so those things, you, you know, your audience has to be considered. That's the biggest thing. So I put on this, the slides, find who cares, and then figure out with your story what's the best way to get it to them and tell the story that it's still your story, but the one that they're going to react to. So, and those things can be refined. I think some, you know, stories can evolve. They do, um, and they should, but it's a matter of testing and going back and, uh, you know, all, all the things that marketers need to see, leads, conversions, they, they've got to be driven off that or depending on who you're telling your story to, you know, are you attracting the right people, investments, um, press. Uh, there's so many different places that stories get told. Um, you just need to refine that story and make sure you go to those people with, with the right one. So there's, there's quantitative tools, certainly, in, mm -hmm. and, and you're talking about doing, doing testing. In direct marketing, I know from talking with Chris, creative times list. You know, it's, uh, some say it's 50-50, some say it's 80-20 or 20-80. And if that relates to what you just said, it's 
the creative is the story and the honing of the story and then the list is the targeting and getting that story to the right person and then you're only at that point you're going to see what it was working uh, whether it was working is there anything that you do further upstream more qualitative when you're honing, honing your story ah, I think you know there have been times when I've done this all by myself. You know, you're just dreaming it up on your own, and that's probably the yes. most dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> we've all done that. Because you get too in, enmeshed in your own words and your own, you know, uh, whatever it is. You, you assume people. Yeah. Yes, rodenticide, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I, if that's your case, make sure you tell your story to your family or to your uh, close friends or uh, bring it up in a bar and see who you can get to listen to you. You know, or uh, we'll just tell later. your story. So, and... Um, you know, the different audiences are tough, and there's, you know, real rules to, to go to each of them, but. Oh, very cool. Thank you. Um, okay, next question. Oh, I just did that one. Okay, this one's for you, Catherine. <laughs> um, when you talk about uh, harnessing share and the wisdom of crowds, do you have a crowd in mind? Is there a particular like um, groundswell that you're shooting for? And this might be another topic from your book. Or are you creating your crowd? Is I it a different story either way? Yeah, um, I think we've got a couple of great examples here. I think what you did with Facebook is a perfect example of you know, going directly after how is this going to get shared? and creating a campaign that was designed to be shared from the very beginning. And if you've got that in mind as you're creating the content, it's gonna be so much easier to have, you know, the sharing is gonna happen naturally. Um, you know, so when you're, before you do the sharing, you've gotta build that social network. So that's another thing um, to think about too. You might not wanna wait until you've got the stuff that you wanna share. Uh, before you start building your social network, that's mm. something that you can start doing, start doing now. You had a built-in crowd, Michelle, because they were already, you know, heavily socially networked. Were the parents? They're the ones who are paying for it. Sometimes the parents are socially networked through the online world, and sometimes they're socially networked through the face-to-face -face world. But almost all parents or at least the client, the person who's involved in the session and paying for the session, they're involved with the friends of the senior or the child. So sometimes I'm able to connect with the parent through the internet, through things like Facebook, and we can push things that way. And there are some parents that instead of putting images on Facebook, I'll give them print pieces instead. And I really base that dependent on the comfort that each individual family has with social media and the internet. Did you create a social network among parents who weren't already? I have to say I did. I, I mean, I, they did it for me is really the real answer. They created the network. But once you start to make friends with one, it's much easier to become friends with the other. And then they'll start self-identifying who they are. And I'll start getting friend requests from the parents of potential clients. All right, so I heard two stories. I heard first the story of the virally connected kids who were talking about the experience of working with you. And then I heard about perhaps not connected parents who were talking more about the way they felt, the way they interacted with the canvas, the way you interacted with porters. So this is different stories, but it all equals cash register for you. Well, sure, it all equals potential clients. Cool, thank you. All right, this was a good one. Back to you, Shannon. The, when a re story gets repeated, you lose control over it. How do you make sure that the story leads back to you and not back to Sotheby's or back to Stradivarius or back to some violinist who's not going to make your catch to ring? I don't think you can. Once you launch that story out into the world, it takes its, a life of its own. So when you're crafting that story, you better prepare for it to be repeated and listen for those things that could get wrong. Sometimes things get wrong and it benefits you. <laughs> so 
that's okay too. Uh, and it's very, it's like, you know, the kid game where you, you know, start out, somebody says a sentence and it goes, gets passed along and when it finally comes back, you say it's completely different. Stories are like that too. In fact, if you look in the newspaper, if you've ever had anything written about you and read the newspaper, is it, is it ever right? No. So, and that's only one degree. So there's, there's um, you know, the stories are going to be changed as they get launched. And sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's negative. But I don't think you can control it. All right, so that was a setup question for Catherine because you have done this, this scientific work on keywords to ensure that the keyword actually leads back to you. And is there a way of crafting stories now using some of this science that kind of buys a policy for what Shannon was just talking about? The short version of the answer to that would be to make sure it's in the title. Give me the medium version. The, yeah, if, you know, the keyword, you make sure the keyword's in the title of the article and the title of the Twitter and the title of the little blurb that you're sharing in whatever social media, and usually that's the part that gets retweeted or reshared. Um, so it's the keeping that are linked to, it's those links back to your website. That are you inventing keywords or are you just co-opting them? Um, sometimes inventing keywords is good, but as in the case of rodenticide, rodenticide. yeah, <laughs> um, I, I tend to stick to the tried and true. Cool, thank you. David, right. can I add to this? Please, go. So some of my stories are kind of taken from me. I will put a logo on the images that I put on Facebook, but it's very easy for anyone to make the image their profile page, and then you crop in on the image, and a logo can be cropped right out. And when you make an image a profile, the link back to Michelle Massey Barnes Photography is also gone, unlike when they share it to their page. So I have this happen a lot. And at first, I found it extremely frustrating and sort of agonized over it. And then I realized, like you said, I can't control it. It's kind of part of the game. And what I've realized is even in those times when someone is cropping the logo out, I still have the relationship that I've built with them. So even if Michaela crops the logo out, she's still able to talk about her experience face to face. And that can be just as powerful. So the message leads back to Michaela instead of back to you. The message leads back to Michaela, but they don't say to her, I mean, like, they, it, the conversation isn't just nice picture. It's, wow, I really liked your senior pictures. And then she'll go on to say, I had such a fabulous time with Michelle. I had such a great time with this company. This is where I had my senior portraits done. Because we've established that kind of relationship and I did the things to make sure that she was going to have that kind of an experience. Cool. All right, next question. Catherine, is SEO becoming less important as the influence of social media grows or the opposite? They're one and the same. <laughs> um, I, increasingly, I think social media is a big part of SEO. I mean, this is a debate that you could get people who are specialists in SEO and social media to get into you know, a, a great big debate about if you wanted to, but um, to me, the lines between the two are, are blurring rapidly, um, especially with Google Plus and social search and the sorts of phenomenon that Google we've Plus, seen. Google Plus, I agree. I constantly see Twitter stuff showing up in Bing and, Sir, and Google listings, but Facebook is a bit of a walled garden. It's not getting that exposure. Is that some create a different challenge for, for telling a story in multiple spaces, or can you get any leverage from one to the other? Uh, both. <laughs> Sorry. A straight answer <laughs> out of you. <laughs> yes, you can get leverage from one to the other, and then you can, you know, take the best of what you can get out of any particular medium like Facebook. You've got to treat each one differently, I guess, would be Yeah, this was a challenge a few years there. ago when you saw a lot of content going into Flash that wasn't getting listed or getting listed with great fidelity. And the same questions we were getting at the same podium at a different program about, okay, how do you, how do you get any viral juice out of that? How do you get any listing lift off of that when in fact the tools and the communities are deliberately closing themselves off? And what you're saying is both. Uh, in the case of, you know, so you talked about Flash, which reminds me of video and YouTube. And one of the wonderful things today about YouTube is not only is YouTube indexed well in the third or fourth most popular site on the internet, 
but they're adding transcriptions to all of the video. So more and more, um, the fact that something is an image is less of a barrier. It used to be a huge barrier to mm -hmm. put anything in terms of an image, um, but that's good for a photographer that that's less and less of an issue all the time. All right, now I got a question that I think it was directed originally at Michelle, but I'm gonna ask you to all an answer this one. And that is the challenge when you're a service provider, when you're producing a customized product or when you're pr providing a customized service of telling a story that's really about you and about the value you add as a professional and the thing that, that is your eye and your, your uh, differentiator versus the fact that the client wants what they want. They, they want to tell you how to do your job and they want to tell the, the violin maker how to do their job or the glass maker how to do their job. Um, and they want a particular outcome, whether that's page one or rodenticide or what have you. And there's this constant friction between the story that brought them in and the story that you're going to end up selling. Michelle, you're up. It's true. Although part of what I'm able to do in those initial session consultations is talk about the session and talk about the images that we want to create. So from the beginning, I'm able to add my artistic input. And most of the time, people are coming to me because they do like what they see. I'm also very careful about what I have public, the types of images that I have public. I put on my website and on Facebook the kinds of work that I want to do more of. So if I have a very traditional family come to me, I'm not opposed to working with a traditional family that wants very posed shots, but that's not my favorite kind of work and it's not what I want to be known for. I don't put them visually out the way that I would put out the kinds of work that I want to continue getting, if that makes sense. No, it does. It means you're writing um, an aspirational campaign instead of a, just this is what I did this week. Yes. That's very interesting. I think that when you tell a story and you want a particular reaction to that story, that if the person reacting to it doesn't fit your model, you should feel free to reject that sale or that person and stick to the people that are going to appreciate your story and retell it well. And I've had this experience in, in software sales, in um, violin making, sometimes people are insecure. They want to buy an instrument that makes them sound like high fits in the, you know, barely graduated seventh grade orchestra. <laughs> it can't be done. You don't want that person because they will, they're never going to say, I'm not a good violinist. They're always going to say, that was a bad violin. You, you go, those people got to go. So, and it hurts when you're turning down a lot of money. People will pay a lot. Charlie you know, Parker did his best work on a plastic saxophone. <laughs> he had hocked his horn for heroin and then <laughs> uh, or, or an image, you know, if yeah. you're, if, if you're um, you know, you want to look like a supermodel and you don't, you don't maybe want that, you don't, might not want that business. Or somebody has a building and it's right next to a landfill, there's only a certain amount you can do with taking an image of that property. And if you want happy customers, there's some people that maybe you need to just say, I can't do this for you and actually turn the work down. Avoiding failure is another name for success. You want the story to be told the right way. I hear you. Catherine. Um, gosh, I can only echo what's been said here already, so I'll, I'll take just a little bit of different tack with it. If you're trying to, if you do have a couple of different messages for a couple of different audiences, um, getting back to my tech background, um, you've got some neat alternatives for how to share those different messages to different people. Uh, so, for example, um, HubSpot is a great marketing tool for getting a distinct email campaigns out to different people and tying those campaigns back to landing pages on the website that are unique to different audiences and that can even change as a prospect has moved through your process. So if they've already come to your website and they've already got the graduation photograph, um, the next time they come back to that page, they'll get served a a button that instead of get your graduation photo, it'll be come back for your Christmas portrait or something along those Wedding, lines. babies. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, yeah, yours you could set up on milestones <laughs> after 16 <laughs> years, after another five years, yeah. 
a really long drip marketing campaign. But the, the tools for those are accessible and affordable now, too. And that tool, you, you gave it a name? HubSpot. HubSpot. All right, we're just going to have another 10 for you. <laughs> All right, um, next two are going to be panel questions, and I want to get your last questions in. This is last call at the bar, okay? So if you've been waiting to write your card, now is the time. Um, what's the value of LinkedIn in business development? I always think of LinkedIn as a poaching tool, but there's, there's all sorts of elephant in the roomism about talking social media and findability and not talking LinkedIn. Do you use it? Do you use it? I recently updated my profile on LinkedIn. I did grab my name <laughs> early Yay. on and didn't do anything with it, but I have recently started using it. And as I went through and linked in with a lot of my contacts and a lot of my clients, it was a very light-hearted, non-selly way to say hello and to just show up in their social world again. Half of winning is showing up. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, exactly. I mean, we're here tonight networking, right? Right. And that's all LinkedIn is, is the online version of networking. I always say that if you've got a business card, you belong in LinkedIn. And it's perfect, just as you described. It's a very non-obtrusive way to get in front of people and remind people that you're there. And it's free, so can't do better than that. All right, now I want to get a couple economic stories out of each one of you, because that's the other elephant in the room, is in startups that you never have an established marketing budget. And if you do, it's never big enough to do what you want to do with it. So there are some stories waiting to be told here in each of your uh, realms of experience to talk about how you struggled with the economics of a particular startup marketing campaign and what solutions you came up with. Uh, let me start with you, Catherine. I'm trying to think where to start that one. <laughs> there are so many, yeah. Pick the one that comes to your mind right now. Well, my own startup is the one that comes to mind <laughs> right now. Um, starting my next startup, Beyond Startup and helping second stage companies. And with this startup, uh, I'm doing all of the things that we just talked about on that top 10 list. You know, I'm gonna start this one for the cheapest you know, way I know how. And it's really fun to be able to take advantage of these tools that did not exist you know, 10 years ago when I did my last startup. So it's, it's a really fun time. Well, eight, I think, since the last one, yeah. I, there are so many great tools, but I think it, a lot of marketing comes back down, especially B2B marketing, find out who cares and where are they? How can you touch them? So what you're spending really is your time, which is an even more limited resource perhaps than your money. True, especially in, in true sh startups. But that's, that's the same method even when you have tons of money. You're still looking for those people that care and how to get to them for the, uh, the best bang for your buck. It's the same thing, no matter if you're one shop or or big? I had the same t time investment. It was really in the senior modeling campaign. It was my time coordinating the sessions, photographing the girls. I did have a very interesting advantage with the senior modeling campaign, and that's that in addition to using them as the visual images to get out to the high school senior audience, I was also training a new photographer. And it, it was, I was able to take those sessions and make them part of my marketing, but also part of my training, which even though I was investing significant time, I was going to need to invest the time with this photographer anyway, because we had our first wedding together in August. It wasn't our wedding, it was the first wedding we photographed together, but we needed to be ready for that. And so those modeling campaigns were a way for me to have that hands-on training and that experience with her. Awesome, thank you, okay. Somebody took me up on last call. Michelle, you won the lottery. In your relationship development marketing, do you ever measure likelihood to recommend? So you're looking at different accounts and you're saying, how likely is this one versus this one? And how, how do you measure likelihood to recommend? That's a really interesting question. Thank you for a very interesting question. I don't have a specific statistic or matrix that I use, but I always have a read from how our ordering appointment went and how I was received when I delivered their images. So I can tell, like someone that hugs me after the first consultation, they're very likely to recommend, <laughs> <laughs> right? 
right? Yeah. And so those are people that I am likely to do extra pieces and extra things for because I already know I'm in the door. Someone that has a very, f we have a very formal ending and it doesn't seem as warm and relationship based, that tells me that they might not have that word of mouth marketing that my business does so well with. And it's not that I'll necessarily ignore them, but I might not invest in them the same way that I invest in my huggers. <laughs> All right, so there's the hug metric. There's the hug metrics, yes. <laughs> Great answer. Let's give it up for this panel. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Catherine, for your expertise. Stick around a little bit afterwards. Ask those questions. You're too embarrassed to write on, out on cards. Thank you to you, our participants, and both of you watching out there in TV land, because those questions were the best part of the program. No, no. I mean, it, there was no bad part of the program, let's face it. Thank you, Ann Arbor Spark, for putting, up with, uh, putting us up. Uh, and thank you, Knights of the Marketing Roundtable. Can we get hands? There's Chris. There's Don. Where's Sam? Hey, Sam. You're hiding back there. The Knights of the Marketing Roundtable next month present Innovator's Dilemma. And we had a Mar Knights of the Marketing Roundtable Dilemma. And to the rescue came everybody's favorite moderator. Next month, our guest moderator is Diane Durance. She's going to be uh, putting together a program on Innovator's Dilemma here in this very room on Tuesday, October the 9th. Hands of people who don't know who Diane Durance is. Right, no hands. Oh, holy cow. All right, we'll be talking later. Um, and then in uh, November, uh, we have uh, Search Social and Mobile uh, Trends. This is uh, a different program every year because the trends are different every year. And in, in December, uh, our last program of the year on creative, there's a bookmark. Mary Cat, where are the bookmarks? Okay, where's Mary Cat? Okay. Uh, up there on the table just as you're exiting and uh, we'll have new bookmarks for you later this year with uh, the short season that we're going to have in 2013. Uh, check out all the fabulous startup and marketing related activities at Ann Arbor uh, USA dot org slash events. Uh, and I think that is everything we came to say today. So we stand adjourned. Thanks very much. <laughs>